started raining so it, it stopped by now but I had to take refuge on the porch and Stravinsky eventually takes refuge in the United States yes World War II is looming and so ultimately he settles in Hollywood he's only a couple of miles away from Schoenberg in Brentwood and they do not talk to each other and if you visited one you did not visit the other before and after this move Stravinsky has been the grand man of neoclassicism. He writes in all genres virtually as facile in some ways as Mozart. So we have concerti, always the through line of ballets, operas, symphonies, you name it, he writes it. And to the point, oh, he also uh, conducts his own works and does serve as a pianist in some over the years. Many wonderful neoclassic works, but we gotta move. And in the 1950s, much has changed, even in the 1940s, early 50s. Schoenberg has died. Webern has also died, actually a few years before, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, Pierre Boulez, who we've seen conducting the Bartok uh, Concerto No. 1 for piano and orchestra, writes an article and says, Schoenberg is dead, long live Webern. But they're both dead. What he means is that Schoenberg was still uh, a, a child of the past, a voice from the past, he never really cut away from that post-romantic tradition. Uh, sonatas and suites aside, symphonies, variation cycles. And the man who's really looking towards the future is Webern. And in Webern, at least Boulez and some of his uh, uh, contemporaries, and we'll talk about him too, somewhere down the line, a couple weeks from now, uh, they perceive not only pitch rows, but also rhythmic rows, attack rows, ta ta tu ta ta ta, but even rows of instruments. So maybe a flute, bassoon, string bass, and string bass, bassoon, flute, as it goes along. And these series of uh, of entities makes this music called serialism, and has nothing to do with post toasties. Stravinsky, by this point has had his uh, wife die on him, first wife. He writes a symphony in C, and he's proud to say you can't hear any of my agony in there. Matter of fact, at one point in his neoclassic period, he says, I believe music is unable to express anything except itself, a series of relationships. Okay, speaking about relationships, during that first marriage, he has been pursuing an affair. There's a rumor about him and Coco Chanel. I can't speak to that, but I can speak. Uh, Vera de Bosset, who, after the death of his first wife, does become his uh, lifelong companion, marries her. Uh, they're in America. There's a transitional piece, Agon, wonderful, wonderful late ballet. Stravinsky has this through line of ballets, and now that he's in... Oh, so, so uh, Robert Kraft, uh, Stravinsky's assistant, and he's an excellent conductor. Uh, some of his uh, dialogues which were published uh, between uh, Kraft and Stravinsky are somewhat suspect in the Alma Mahler uh, tradition, but can't touch this guy in many cases as a conductor. Some of his interpretations of late Stravinsky works under Stravinsky's super, uh, supervision rival Stravinsky's own performances of same, and Kraft also does some definitive recordings of Edgar Varese, who is next up on the ballot on the palette, on the docket. So two just brief late Stravinsky serial works. The 
first from, to my knowledge, the second opera, or in this case a musical play, for television. Something else happening with Stravinsky. He kind of he was sort of aware that maybe he wasn't at the forefront of the contemporary scene. So he wants to get there again. He, you recall, he's been kind of at the forefront. Everybody's been playing catch up for quite a while, and now with Robert Kraft slipping him the scores of late of Weber in general, he in his late style is back at the forefront. But it's another one of those Faustian bargains with the devil, and by this point he's also done a full opera, neoclassic opera, wonderful, The Rake's Progress, which is yet another Faustian tale with Nick Shadow and uh, Tom Rakewell and True Love. Great stuff. Check it out. Anyway, here we are, and this uh, television opera, the three stylistic periods of Stravinsky have a kind of a descending audience situation. He is world famous with the three ballets. He maintains his reputation as a uh, neoclassic composer, although he is criticized too. Uh, there's the Schoenberg Stravinsky rivalry. There's a piece, uh, Three Satires of Schoenberg, and Schoenberg has a text that says, Look, it's little Modernsky. He's wearing his wig. And referring, of course, to Stravinsky. So the two excerpts of these things, so from, uh, from the flood which is based not only on sections of the book of Genesis, a little bit of the creation story as well as the story of Noah and the Flood, but it's also based on a medieval mystery play, probably the Chester mystery play, which also Benjamin Britten buys into in a larger extent. So there are, the, the, the characters are filled in and, and uh, there are some extra ones, or, or they're, they're applied to the biblical story, but here they are. Noah's wife, and boy, she is not pleased to be going on the ark. And then finally, the Requiem Canticles, written in 1966. This is the year after many of those recordings of Stravinsky uh, and videos that we've seen. And this is not a full Requiem Mass, but just songs for the Requiem, for the Requiem Mass, hence Canticles. And he is in that line of composers who writes a Requiem and then dies, but not without giving us some kicky rhythms again. Stravinsky evidently hated mountains. I was kind of crushed to know this. <laughs> and he is buried in a city beloved by him, and that would be Venice, about as flat as you can imagine. And he's buried right next to Sergei Diaghilev. He had had a falling out with him many years before. What is he saying with this? Composers who write requiems and then die. Mozart, Verdi, Stravinsky. Berlioz wrote his as a young man, so he escaped the curse. And evidently I did too. I wrote a requiem when I was in my 20s. But uh, don't speak too soon. Coronavirus! Joseph Messias Hauer was one of those also rands of music. He developed his own 12-tone method of writing definitely before Schoenberg. Here is one of his early pieces before the 12-tone, but it's still got that concern with pitch class. 